This is a reading of the short story Without Colors by Italo Calvino from his book Cosmicomics. Before forming its atmosphere and its oceans, the Earth must have resembled a gray ball revolving in space, as the moon does now. Where the ultraviolet rays radiated by the sun arrive directly, all the colors are destroyed, which is why the cliffs of the lunar surface, instead of being colored like Earth's, are of a dead, uniform gray. If the Earth displays a very colored countenance, it is thanks to this atmosphere, which filters that murderous light. A bit monotonous, Kuf Kuf confirmed, but restful all the same. I could go for miles and miles at top speed, the way you could move where there isn't any air about, and all I could see was gray upon gray. No sharp contrasts. The only really white white, if there was any, lay in the center of the sun, and you couldn't even begin to approach it with your eyes. And as far as really black black is concerned, there wasn't even the darkness of night, because all the stars were constantly visible. Uninterrupted horizons opened before me with mountain chains just beginning to emerge, gray mountains, above gray rocky plains. And though I crossed continent after continent, I never came to a shore, because oceans and lakes and rivers were still lying underground somewhere or other. You rarely met anyone in those days. There were so few of us. To survive with that ultraviolet, you couldn't be too demanding. Above all, the lack of atmosphere asserted itself in many ways. You take meteors, for example. They fell like hail from all the points of space. Because then we didn't have the stratosphere where nowadays they strike, as if on a roof, and disintegrate. Then there was the silence. No use shouting. Without any air to vibrate, we were all deaf and dumb. The temperature? There was nothing around to retain the sun's heat. When nights fell, it was so cold you could freeze stiff. Fortunately, the Earth's crust warmed us from below. With all those molten minerals which were being compressed in the bowels of the planet. The nights were short. Like the days, the Earth turned around faster. I slept huddled up to a very warm rock. The dry cold all around was pleasant. In other words, as far as the climate went, to tell you the truth, I wasn't so badly off. Among the countless indispensable things we had to do without, the absence of colors, as you can imagine, was the least of our problems. Even if we had known they existed, we would have considered them an unsuitable luxury. The only drawback was a strain on your eyes when you had to hunt for something or someone, because with everything equally colorless, no form could be clearly distinguished from what was behind it or around it. You could barely make out a moving object, a meteor fragment as it rolled, or the serpentine yawning of a seismic chasm, or a lapis being ejected from a volcano. That day I was running through a kind of amphitheater of porous, spongy rocks, all pierced with arches beyond which other arches opened. A very uneven terrain, where the absence of color was streaked by distinguishable concave shadows. And among the pillars of these colorless arches, I saw a kind of colorless flash running swiftly, disappearing, then reappearing further on. Two flattened glows that appeared and disappeared abruptly. I still hadn't realized what they were, but I was already in love and running, in pursuit of the eyes of Io. I went to a sandy wasteland. I proceeded, sinking down among dunes which were always somehow different and yet almost the same. Depending on the point from which you looked at them, the crests of the dunes seemed the uh, outlines of reclining bodies. There you could almost make out the form of an arm folded over a tender breast, with a palm open under a resting cheek. Farther on, a young foot with a slender big toe seemed to emerge. As I stopped to observe those possible analogies, a full minute went by before I realized that, before my eyes, I didn't have a sandy ridge, but the object of my pursuit. She was lying, colorless, overcome with sleep on the colorless sand. I sat down nearby. It was the season, as I know now, when the ultraviolet era was approaching its end on our planet. A way of life about to finish was displaying its supreme peak of beauty. Nothing so beautiful had ever run over the earth as a creature I had before my eyes. 
Eo opened her eyes. She saw me. At first, I believed she couldn't distinguish me, as had happened to me, with her, from the rest of that sandy world. Then she seemed to recognize in me the unknown presence that had pursued her and she was frightened. But in the end, she became aware of our common substance, and there was a half-timid, half-smiling palpitation in the look she gave me, which caused me to emit a silent whimper of happiness. I started conversing, all in gestures. Sand, not sand, I said, first pointing to our surroundings, then to the two of us. She nodded yes, she had understood. Rock? Not rock, I said, to continue that line of reasoning. It was a period in which we didn't have many concepts at our disposal, to indicate what we two were, for example, what we had in common and what was different, was not an easy undertaking. I? You, not I, I tried to explain, with gestures. She was irked. Yes, you, like me, but only so much, I corrected myself. She was a bit reassured, but still suspicious. I, you, together, run, run, I tried to say. She burst out laughing and ran off. We ran along the crest of the volcanoes. In the noon grayness, Ael's flying hair and the tongues of flame that rose from the craters were mingled in a wan, identical fluttering of wings. Fire. Hair. I said to her. Fire, same hair. She seemed convinced. Not beautiful? I asked. Beautiful, she answered. The sun was already sinking into a whitish sunset. On a crag of opaque rocks, the rays, striking sidelong, made some of the rocks shine. Stones there not the same. Beautiful, eh? I said. No, she answered, and looked away. Stones there beautiful, eh? I insisted, pointing to the shiny gray of the stones. No, she refused to look. To you, I. Stones there, I offered her. No, stones here. Eo answered and grasped a handful of opaque ones, but I had already run ahead. I came back with the glistening stones I have collected, but I had to force her to take them. Beautiful, I tried to persuade her. No, she protested, but she looked at them. Removed now from the sun's reflections, they were opaque like the other stones. Only then did she say, Beautiful. Night fell. The first I had spent not embracing a rock, and perhaps for this reason it seemed cruelly shorter to me. The light tended at every moment to erase Ale, to cast a doubt on her presence, but the darkness restored my certainty she was there. The day returned, to paint the earth with grey, and my gaze moved around and didn't see her. I let out a mute cry. Ale, why have you run off? But she was in front of me and was looking for me too. She couldn't see me and silently shouted, Kuf Kuf, where are you? Until our eyesight darkened, examining that sooty luminosity and recognizing the outline of an eyebrow, an elbow, a thigh. Then I wanted to shower Ale with presents, but nothing seemed to me worthy of her. I hunted for some everything that was in some way detached from the uniform surface of the world, everything marked by a speckling, a stain. But I was soon forced to realize that Ale and I had different tastes, if not downright opposite ones. I was seeking a new world beyond the pallid patina that imprisoned everything. I examined every sign, every crack. To tell the truth, something was beginning to change. In certain moments, the colorlessness seemed shot through with variegated flashes. Instead, Ale was a happy inhabitant of the silence that reigns where all vibrations is excluded. For her, Anything that looked likely to break the absolute visual neutrality was a harsh discord. Beauty began for her only when the grayness had extinguished even the remotest desire to be anything other than gray. How could we understand each other? No thing in the world that lay before our eyes was sufficient to express what we felt for each other. But while I was in a fury to wrest unknown vibrations from things, she wanted to reduce everything to the colorless beyond of their ultimate substance. A meteorite crossed the sky, its trajectory passed in front of the sun. Its fluid and fury envelope for an instant acted as a filter to the sun's rays. 
and all of a sudden the world was immersed in the lights never seen before. Purple chasms gaped at the foot of the orange cliffs, and my violet hands pointed to the flaming green meteor while a thought for which word did not yet exist tried to burst from my throat. This for you. From me, this for you. Yes, yes, beautiful. At the same time, I wheeled about, eager to see the new way Aeol would surely shine in the general transfiguration, but I didn't see her. As if in that sudden shattering of the colorless glaze, she had found a way to hide herself, to slip off among the crevices in the mosaic. Aeol! Don't be frightened, Aeol! Show yourself and look! But already the meteorite's arc had moved away from the sun, and the earth was reconquered by its perennial gray, now even grayer to my dazzled eyes, and indistinct, and opaque, and there was no ale. She had really disappeared. I saw her through a long throbbing of days and nights. It was the era when the world was testing the forms it was later to assume. It tested them with the material it had available, even if it wasn't the most suitable, since it was understood that there was nothing definitive about the trials. Trees of smoke-colored lava stretched out twisted branches from which hung thin leaves of slate. Butterflies of ash flying over clay meadows hovered above opaque crystal daisies. Aeol might be the colorless shadow swinging from a branch of the colorless forest or bending to pick gray mushrooms under gray clumps of bushes. A hundred times I thought I glimpsed her, and a hundred times I thought I lost her again. From the wastelands I moved to the inhabited localities. At that time, sensing the changes that would take place, obscure builders were shaping premature images of a remote, possible future. I crossed a piled-up metropolis of stones. I went through a mountain pierced with passageways, like an entrance retreat. I reached a port that opened upon a sea of mud. I entered a garden where, from sandy beds, tall menhirs rose into the sky. The gray stone of the men hairs was covered with a pattern of barely indicated gray veins. I stopped. In the center of this park, Aeol was playing with her female companions. They were tossing a quartz ball into the, the air and catching it. Someone threw it too hard. The ball came within my reach, and I caught it. The others scattered to look for it. When I saw Aeol alone, I threw the ball into the air and caught it again. Aeol ran over, hiding. I threw the quartz ball drawing Aeol farther and farther away. Finally, I showed myself. She scolded me, then laughed, and so we went on playing through strange regions. At that time, the strata of the planet were laboriously trying to establish an equilibrium through a series of earthquakes. Every now and then, the ground was shaken by one, and between Aeol and me, crevices opened across which we threw the quartz ball back and forth. These chasms gave the elements compressed in the heart of the earth an avenue of escape, and now we saw outcroppings of rocks emerge, or fluid clouds, or boiling jets spurred up. As I went on playing with Aeol, I noticed that a gassy layer had spread over the earth's crust, like a low fog slowly rising. A moment before it had reached our ankles, and now we were up in it from up to our knees, then to our hips. At that sight, a shadow of uncertainty and fear grew in Aeol's eyes. I didn't want to alarm her, and so, as if nothing were happening, I went on with our game. But I, too, was anxious. It was something never seen before. An immense fluid bubble was swelling around the earth and completely unfolding it. Soon it would cover us from head to foot, and he could say what the consequences would be. I threw the ball to ale beyond a crack opening in the ground. But my throat proved inexplicably shorter than I had intended and the ball fell into the gap. The ball must have become suddenly very heavy. No, it was a crack that had suddenly yawned enormously, and now Aeol was far away, beyond the liquid, wavy expanse that had opened between us and was foaming against the shore of rocks. And I leaned from the shore, shouting, Aeol! Aeol! In my voice, its sound, the very sound of my voice spread loudly, as I had never imagined it, and the waves rumbled still louder than my voice. In other words... It was all beyond understanding. I put my hands to my deafened ears, and at the same time, I also felt the need to cover my nose and mouth, 
so as not to breathe the heady blend of oxygen and nitrogen that surrounded me. But strongest of all was the impulse to cover my eyes, which seemed ready to explode. The liquid mass spread out at my feet had suddenly turned a new color, which blinded me, and exploded in a very articulate cry, which, a little later, took on a specific meaning. Ale! The sea is blue! The great change so long awaited had finally taken place. On the earth now there was air and water, and over that newborn blue sea, the sun, also colored, was setting, an absolutely different and even more violent color. So I was driven to go on with my sen senseless cries, like, How red the sun is, Ale! Ale! How red! Night fell. Even the darkness was different. I ran looking for Ale, emitting cries without rhyme or reason to express what I saw. The stars are yellow, Ale! Ale! I didn't find her that night or the days and nights that followed. All around the world poured out colors, constantly new. Pink clouds gathered in violets cumuli, which unleashed gilded lightning. After the storms, long rainbows announced hues that still hadn't been seen, all in possible combinations. And chlorophyll was already beginning its progress. Mosses and ferns grew, grew green in the valleys where torrents ran. This was finally the setting worthy of Ale's beauty. But she wasn't there. Without her, all this very color sumptuousness seemed useless to me. Wasted. I ran all over the earth. I saw again the things I had once known gray, and I was still amazed that discovering fire was red, ice white, the sky pale blue, the earth brown, that rubies were ruby colored, and topazes the color of topaz, and emeralds emerald. And ale? With all my imagination, I couldn't picture how she would appear to my eyes. I found the manhurt garden, now green with trees and grasses. In the murmuring pools, red and blue and yellow fish were swimming. Ale's friends were still leaping over the lawn, tossing the iridescent ball. But how changed they were. One was blonde with white skin, one brunette with herb olive skin, one brown hair with pink skin, one had red hair and was dotted with countless enchanting freckles. Ale, I cried. Where is she? Where is Ale? What does she look like? Why isn't she with you? Her friend's lips were red, their teeth white, and then their tongues and gums were pink. Pink, too, were the clip of their breasts. Their eyes were aquamarine blue, cherry black, hazel and maroon. Why, Ale, they answered. She's gone. We don't know. And they went back to the game. I tried to imagine Ale's hair and their hair skin in every possible color, but I couldn't picture her. And so, as I looked for her, I explored the surface of the globe. If she's not up here, I thought, that means she must be below. And at that time, the first earthquake that came along, I flung myself into a chasm, down, down into the bowels of the earth. Ale! Ale! I called in the darkness. Ale, come see how beautiful it is outside. Horse, I felt silent, and at that moment, Ale's voice, soft, calm, answered me. Shh! I'm here. Why are you shouting so much? What do you want? I couldn't see a thing. Ale, come outside with me. If only you knew. Outside. I don't like it outside. But you, before. Before it was before. Now it's different. All that confusion has come. I lied. No. No, it was just a passing changing of light. Like that time with the meteorite. It's over now. Everything is the way it used to be. Come. Don't be afraid. If she comes out, I thought, after the first moments of bewilderment, she'll become used to the colors. She'll be happy, and she'll understand that I lied to her for her own good. Really? Why should I tell you stories? Come, let me take you outside. No, you go ahead. I'll follow you. But I'm impatient to see you again. You'll see me only the way I like. Go ahead and don't turn around. The telluric shocks cleared the way for us. The strata of rock opened fanwise and we advanced through the gaps. I heard Ale's light footsteps behind me. One more quake and we were outside. I ran along steps of a salt and granite which turned like the pages of a book. 
Already, at the end, the breach that would lead us into the open air was tearing wide. Already the earth's crust was appearing beyond the gap, sunny and green. Already the light was forcing its way toward us. There, now I would see the colors brighten also on Ail's face. I turned to look at her. I heard her scream as she drew back toward the darkness. My eyes still dazzled by the earlier lights could make out nothing. Then the rumble of the earthquake drowned everything, and a wall of rock suddenly rose, vertically, separating us. Ail, where are you? Try to come over to this side, quickly, before the rock settles. And I ran along the wall looking for an opening, but the smooth gray surface was, was compact, without a fissure. An enormous chain of mountains had formed at that point. As I had been projected outward, into the open, Ail had remained beyond the rock wall, closed in the bowels of the earth. Ail, where are you? Why aren't you out here? And I looked around at the landscape that stretched away at my feet. Then, all of a sudden, those pea-green lawns where the first scarlet poppies were flowering, those canary-yellow fields which stripped the tawny hills sloping downward to a sea of full of azure glints, all seemed so trivial to me, so banal, so false, so much in contrast with Ail's person, with Ail's world, with Ail's idea of beauty, that I realized her place could never have been out here. And I realized, with grief and fear, that I had remained out here, that I would never again be able to escape those gilded and silvered gleams, those little clouds that turned from pale blue to pink, those green leaves that yellowed every autumn, and that Ail's perfect world was lost forever, so lost I couldn't even imagine it anymore. And nothing was left that could be remind me of it, even remotely, nothing except perhaps that cold wall of grey stone.